Here we are. We are, what, two weeks, two weeks from Easter celebration. We're still singing the hallelujahs and the hymns of the day. We're still excited, still happy to hold on to the news that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, still chanting to one another those hallelujahs and that Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. And I have preached sermons. You have heard other people, other preachers preach sermons that Easter changes everything, that we are now the Easter people. We have everything different because Christ is risen from the dead. And that is all true. But maybe, maybe you're a little like I was back in junior high, living in north central, northeastern Wisconsin. Because Easter comes in March, Easter comes in April, and everyone's celebrating spring, everyone's talking about, you know, the Hollywood movies are singing songs about Easter bonnets and the Easter parade, and all of this talk of spring, you look out the window in northeastern Wisconsin in March and April, and it doesn't look a whole lot different than February. In fact, it can still snow, it can still freeze. It can still be winter. And you wonder what the big deal is. You know, maybe, maybe after Easter we could put our, our parka hoods down and some of the women put their Easter hats on for the moment of Easter and then put the hoods back up because it was blowing outside. And you wonder, did Easter, I wondered back then, did Easter really change anything? It still looks an awful lot like it did yesterday. It still looks an awful lot like it did a month ago. And, you know, Portland... Portland is not so different. You know, it's been rainy forever, Chris, forever. <laughs> they keep saying 50 degrees and sunny, and it hasn't happened yet. And it's not just the weather. There's other stuff that hasn't changed. At least it doesn't seem to have changed. I mean, there are still wars happening in places that, you know, six years ago you didn't know existed. You had to go to the atlas to find out where they are, where they, where they were. And those wars, those rumors of wars, Jesus said they would keep on coming. Illnesses keep on hanging on, keep on holding on to our bodies and the bodies of people we love. It isn't like suddenly all those things went away. So what difference does, what difference has Easter made in our lives, really. You know, that's why I like this story about the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Because they've heard, they've heard the news. The women came and told the disciples and all the people that they were with that morning. They heard that the grave was empty. They heard that the stone was rolled away. They heard that the seal was broken and there was a vision of angels saying that he was alive. They heard that news, but still, they were walking home now. After all the party was over, they were walking home and wondering what really had changed, weren't they? I mean, their questions, you listen to the questions as they talked to this unrecognized stranger, this, this, this man who had joined them on the journey. They were kept from seeing him because maybe, maybe their questions just had drawn their attentions, and God let their questions shape what they saw and how they saw it. Those questions were pretty serious stuff. They were wondering, you know. We heard these stories. We heard that the women said, and some of our party, as if they, as if, because maybe women, you know, who, they, they, may not, they may have gotten confused, but some of, our, some of the guys went and saw, and they came back with the same story, but still their questions persisted. We had hoped, the one says to Jesus, we had hoped that this Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. We had hoped. And now we don't know what to do with our hopes, what to do with our questions. They were letting their questions shape the way they saw everything. And I wonder, are you and I that different? I mean, we sang our hallelujahs. We heard the story told again. Matthew told us. John told us, depending on which service you came to on Easter morning, told you the story that the tomb was empty, that death has been swallowed up in victory, that the stone was rolled away, and the women came, shared the same news with you that they shared 
way back then. And we ran with Peter and John to look into the, into the tomb to see that it was empty. And like Peter, walked away wondering what it all meant. Again, Peter letting his questions define how he saw, how he understood, how he perceived. Those questions that were on Peter's mind, those questions that were on Cleopas and his companion's heart that day as Jesus met them on the road. Questions. And those questions you and I still have, and those questions define our moments, don't they? We wonder why cancer is still around. We wonder why wars and rumors of wars and plagues and pestilences and all that stuff that Jesus prophesied back in Mark 13, all of that stuff is still happening. If Easter has happened, why isn't everything really different? Why does bad stuff still happen? Why do the people I love still struggle? Why do I struggle? Why, why, why? Those questions define We let them define the way we look at reality, the way we look at the moments in which we live. Those questions seem so huge. And Jesus meets them in their questions. Jesus catches up with them on the journey, seven mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. We're really not quite sure if historians, archeologists really aren't quite sure which small ruined village should be identified with Emmaus, and maybe that's a good thing because that reminds us that wherever we're walking, wherever we're heading, our Emmauses, Jesus catches up with us as well. And he lets us ask our questions, doesn't he? He lets those guys ask their questions. He lets them define the moment for a moment with their questions before he directs them to himself. Did you not know that it was necessary that the Christ must suffer and die? All of their questions point to that answer from Jesus' mouth. Jesus doesn't try to answer why the bad guys won for a moment there when Pilate washed his hands and said, let him be crucified. Jesus doesn't try to explain why and how these men of faith, Caiaphas, Annas, and all of the high priestly crowd how they couldn't see that this one was the Christ, the Messiah. He doesn't answer their questions. He just points them to himself as the one who, for whom it was necessary. It was necessary because we live in a broken world. We live lives that are defined by our questions and by what we can see, by what we can sense, by what we can figure out and get our hands around, even though that might not be very much. For us, it's everything. Those questions and those realities in which we think we live. You know, sometimes, oftentimes, I'll talk about how St. Augustine described that longing for God that we have as broken, sinful human beings as the God-sized whole. And that's true, and I think Augustine was onto something, but I think also there's a a difficulty with talking about a God-sized whole because it can lead us, you and me, to believe that that God-sized whole is, is where God fits. Not that God fills that hole, but that he fits there nicely. And so he's the God that we can understand that he's the God who who we can figure out. He's the God who we can put on a leash and pull out when we need him. I'll say for for a friend of ours is in trouble and so we pray. So put the, pull God back out of his hole and say, go go to it, God. Um, we pull God out of his this God sized hole we have him in and say, solve my problem, God. Define, understand, explain what's going on to me, Lord. We think It's easy to think of that God-sized hole as a place where God fits rather than a place that he fills. And when we see God as somebody that we fit into our lives, we fit into our hearts, the problem arises when we find out that that picture of God is not the real one. There's a picture, I think, for a while... 
Every Missouri Synod home in America, probably the world, had these three pictures in their house somewhere. There's the picture of Jesus knocking on the door. There's the picture that um, the artist Schliemann pointed. I think his name was Schliemann. The picture of Jesus all dressed in brown with a brown background, looking very pious in the, in the picture frame. Everyone's got that. And then there's the, the picture of the size of a couch, isn't it? The, the whole picture is gigantic. It's, it's the thing you put over a couch or a Davenport in Appleton, Wisconsin, they read as we called them. And in that huge picture, there's this huge landscape. And there is three little figures about right there in the picture. And it's the two disciples and Jesus walking with their backs to you, walking on the way to Emmaus. I think that picture is awesome. And I just really kind of got this this morning, this week. Why, why is the landscape gigantic? I mean, it's couch-sized, and the figures are, like, little. Why would the artist waste so much time on landscape? Because, I think, he wants us to see two things. One, that what God is doing is bigger than we, you and I, can figure out for ourselves. He's got, you know, if you read Job, if you read those places where God answers Job at the end of the book, Job isn't, God isn't simply saying to, saying to Job, you're Job and I'm God and so there. He's actually saying, you know, Job, being God is a very complex and very amazing and very huge thing. I'm in charge of, of the rabbits giving birth. I'm in charge of the horses that run. I'm in, I'm in charge of the cows that make their milk. I'm in charge of the stars and the planets. Someone has to keep Jupiter from crashing into Mars. And so being God is much more complex than you, Job, you human beings can understand because we as human beings just define things in our own terms. And so the artist maybe is showing this huge picture to show that that's a God-sized view. But he's also showing Jesus meeting those two guys on the way where they're going. Meeting them where they're at. Meeting them in their questions. Meeting them in their doubts and fears meeting them with his resurrection, with himself as the Christ who has suffered and risen from the dead, who has died and is alive again, meeting them as himself with all that that means, but meeting them where they need him to be, right with them, showing them that the answer to the questions that we have ultimately can be found in Jesus. There's another saying of Augustine, Augustine, however you want to pronounce it, that we are never at rest until we find our rest with God, with Christ. My heart is not at rest until I find my rest with thee, Augustine says. And that's really what the disciples on the road to Emmaus remind us. Because they, their hearts burned, to be sure, but their hearts were at rest. At rest to the point where they could run back through the dusk, run back in the twilight, run back with all the highwaymen and whatever else would be between Emmaus and Jerusalem, and even get into the gate to find the disciples to tell them that Jesus is the answer to their questions. Jesus, risen from the dead, is the answer to the question. In the big world of that picture, Jesus brings the news of his resurrection, the news of hope in him, the reason to sing hallelujahs to those two disciples walking on the road as assurance that he will also bring his resurrection, that he will bring himself and all that comes with it and put himself so that he fills the God-sized whole, that he shows you and me that while the answers to our questions may not be the words we're looking for, because we want a yes, no, we want a, this is what's going to happen tomorrow, we want 
answers to our questions of why. But what he gives us is, as an answer is better than that because the answer he gives is himself. Himself risen from the dead. Himself holding onto you with such an embrace so you would know that he loves you. You would know. Anyone who's ever quieted a child, anyone who's ever held a grieving friend, anyone who's ever held somebody so troubled that that embrace is what calms them down. Jesus' embrace is what calms us down, calms the child in the storm, calms us by giving us the assurance that Jesus, with his love, with his knowledge of all that it means for him to be God, is working for the good that he has in mind for us, which is our salvation, which is our resurrection, which is now, at this moment, the forgiveness and the hope that we have. He's meeting us in the big picture with himself for you, for us, to say that I am with you in this. I am with you in it, and I am the one who's overcome death. I'm the one who's broken the power of sin. I'm the one who ransomed you from the devil. There's nothing that I won't carry you through to your Easter. And that's why everything is different, because now we know that our Easter awaits. Our resurrection awaits. Our God meets us in the one who is risen from the dead. Everything is different because we see things from the perspective of that resurrection, knowing that that Jesus is with us always. And that gives us hope. Amen. And now may the peace that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Oh, God.